Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Phil Briggs. Phil is a U.S. Navy veteran who served aboard the USS John C. Stannis as a journalist and public affairs specialist. He studied broadcast journalism at the Defense Information School and at Arizona State and worked in terrestrial radio for years before becoming a voice actor for clients that include Honda, Chevy, Corona, the Food Network, the Travel Channel, Pandora, and Spotify. He's now the host and producer of the Vet Story podcast, which you can find at ConnectingVets.com. So Phil is really putting his education and his experience together. He sat with our resident vets, Pete and Scott, and you get these three together and evidently the fat will be chawed. Good luck keeping these guys corralled. Please enjoy our special guest today, Phil Briggs. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Bill Briggs from ConnectingVets.com, and I like to be naked on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. I am now unbuckling my pants, because this is my favorite kind of way to do shows. <laughs> we definitely did not want a photo, uh-huh. especially uh-huh. with that. This is going to be our first YouTube Live. <laughs> Hey man, so listen, I, you know, we got Scott here in the in the studio with me, and it's always fun when we all get together and three vets and Scott and I have spent the whole day at a, the Nixon Library grabbing shows with fucking Jack Brennan. How crazy is that? And Greg Daddis, who, you know, Scott being the guy who I, I type names wrong, you say them wrong. <laughs> I did. I yeah. misspelled things all the time. It was mental block though, because whenever you say, "How do you say your name?" you mispronounce it. Right. Inevitably, Phil yeah. knows. Yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> Phil, aren't you in media of some form too? Don't you do radio podcasting? And yeah, I'm, that's I sure joke. do, man. Yeah. Connectingvets dot com. I do the podcast called Vet Story, and I also do a new podcast called The CV Report, which basically stands for Connecting Vets. But I came from radio after the Navy, so yeah, mispronouncing things in interviews is. You know, my forte. What did you do in the Navy, man? Were you a cook? Bosun's mate? <laughs> Bosun's mate, yeah. yeah. Salty sailor. It's, no, only, it's the only the rate Pete beat. knows. Bosun's mate? Were you Bosun's mate? No, I was a pilot. So Bosun's mate. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying you're on no, the boat. I'm a, I'm a rare breed. I got a chance to do what I did in the Navy. I was a, it, was, it used to be called J.O., but uh-huh. now it's called Mass Comm. Right. But, um, yeah, I was a journalist on an aircraft carrier and, you know, kind of cross trained into being a photo mate as well. And, um, I got a chance to get out of the military and go be a journalist. So you said yes. Yay for me. I get no retirement and I'm underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you do get to do what you love, you know, and there is something to be said for that. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it was really a cool tour. I mean, I got out of the Navy after doing my four and out the door and really, didn't look back at first, um, not out of disinterest or lack of love for, you know, my shipmates and everybody that, you know, I served with, but it was just like, I I got a job at rock radio and nobody cared that I was in the service. They were like, Hey dude, who have you interviewed? Where's your morning show? What's your market size? And I was like, I'm out of the Navy. What's up guys. And I got lucky man from that point of getting out in 1998 to a couple years later, I'm interviewing bands like the Mighty Boss Tones and Aerosmith and, and all the way to ZZ Top. I mean, you name it. We we, we sat down with a ton of rock and rollers and, um, you know, I kind of forged my way through morning show glory and getting fired every four years. <laughs> right. I love how in the radio industry, and this is the, one of the reasons why I think it struggles so much now, is like you come to love Phil, the character, whatever character you play on that morning show, and then your contract doesn't renew or they just send you away, and then there's never a word of you ever again as if you didn't exist. And it's sort of a big fuck you to the fans because you're like, hey, what happened to Phil? Like, just, just tell me, like, fond farewell, Phil's moved on to another station, we wish, never, ever, ever, in other word, you get um, Chuck Cunningham every single time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's normally after, like, some sort of, like, joke that really wasn't that bad. Right. 
you know. But that was like Phil's goal, to... probably, is like, how can I get fired in four years? Within four years, I plan to be fired. Right. Because uh, that could be your brand, Phil, like the most fired DJ. Now, coming up, Phil Briggs, the most fired DJ in all of radio. When you get fired from ra- radio, you know, they give you a box of shit, and then do you <laughs> hum to yourself the WKRP theme song? <laughs> you should, but actually, um, I think I'm in competition for most fired DJ because uh-huh. really, in the 90s and early 2000s, we all considered Howard Stern the benchmark. Sure. So if I said anything on my way out, it was always like WNBC, followed by a <laughs> you know stiff F you. Yeah, I think between me and Phil. And you, there's probably a really, really stiff competition on who can quote the most movie lines. But Phil okay. has by far one of the most impressive repertoires. He could be for shit on air right. or doing anything, which he's not. He's great because yeah. I've been on the show. is is amazing. But uh, your repertoire is pretty deep, my brother. <laughs> well, I'm kind of a big deal. Hmm. I just Beautiful. recently got... A, right there. I love the recent Anchorman shout out I got on Twitter from you, as a matter of fact, how you stopped watching Anchorman, Ron Burgundy, and read my book. And that was that was pretty cool. That was high praise coming from Phil Briggs. You know, I was toying... Twitter always trips me out, too. It trips me up, rather, because I, I want to think of the perfect thing to say in 140 characters. And believe it or not, it takes me like 30 minutes to think of like something to say <laughs> oftentimes. But I went with the Anchorman reference, but the one I was going to go with was the fact that... Um, I was on the toilet till both legs fell asleep reading Echo and Ramani. <laughs> Huge. And this just in, Phil, welcome to 2019. There's actually 256 characters you get to use on Twitter now, so your world <laughs> has expanded. I don't, don't freaking know, man. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, listen, I, you know, I know we're going to have fun having Yuck Fest because that's pretty much what's what we're stuck with because that's what we do, but... Um, Let's talk a little bit about connecting vets so we can sort of pay the bills, and then I'm sure we'll get sidetracked. But I, w- I want folks to understand, because look, people all over the place are looking to f- for podcasts to listen to. People want to support vets. You have great stories. So help me out with what is it that you guys are trying to accomplish over there? Yeah, right on. And I appreciate both you guys, because not only getting the guest chair tonight on the Break It Down show, but uh, you were two of the first people I actually interacted with when we started up Connecting Vets. It was over a year ago, and it was the brainchild of a guy at CBS Radio named Mark O'Brien and another guy, Steve Swenson, who said, who said corporate radio doesn't do jack nothing for veterans. There's no specific veteran-centric, military-centric thing that's done by really most of the major networks. And I'm talking CBS radio, CBS TV. I mean, they have their TV shows and they have their, you know, fictional dramas and stuff, but nobody really does stuff authentic for veterans. So these two guys got together and they said, well, what could we do? And they said, well, let's make a website. Well, let's make a website and like a radio station that's just all veteran stuff. And they kind of, you know, toyed around with it. And they're like, well, how does a radio station work in just Washington, D.C.? Because veterans live all over hell in half of Georgia. You know, we can't just make it a Washington, D.C. thing where we're based. So they said, well, let's take it to the web and let's do podcasts. And they put out on, I don't know, a couple different channels out there in social media that they were hiring veterans with broadcast backgrounds or with journalism backgrounds. So a couple guys like myself uh, that you know went to defense information school and were mass comm guys, combat camera guys, um, we got we got tracked down. I think I got a message on LinkedIn at the time, and I had already quit radio. I was out of radio. I was just doing voiceover for television commercials and radio commercials, and I just you know I'd kind of give it up on media because I was like I keep getting freaking fired. This sucks. I'm just gonna do my own thing. So I replied to this thing, and literally they called me like two days later and said, can you come to D.C. tomorrow? And they showed me this project that was like full broadcast studios and desks and reporters. And they're like, we want to staff this with about eight or nine veterans, and we just want to write stories about veterans. We want to cover veterans' issues. We got a guy coming from the VA that's going to help us give advice for veterans trying to get services, but we don't know what to write about. So can you, as the guys that, you know, have DD-214s, as the guys that went through boot camp, can you help us color in between the lines and tell the right stories? So there's like 
six or seven of us that get started. And I start doing a podcast called Bet Story, which just chronicles really cool veterans. And that's when I ran across Scott Husing and the book Echo and Ramadi. And I remember being in the bookstore, actually, Scott, I don't think I ever told you this. I remember being in the bookstore and I was going to buy like three or four books that were written, you know, by vets, combat vets or what have you, war stories. And yours was one of them. And I was like, nah, I'm like, I, I couldn't get that guy. That is, nah, there's no way I could book that. That's because it was like on the end of the row or it just, it looked like it was a pretty legit book. And, you know. <laughs> It's great. It is. It's got words and everything. Yeah. And a picture on a front yeah. picture. So, so I, I forget what I ended up buying that day, but I remember seeing that book and that's when I came across your publisher like some weeks later and we somehow got connected through emails and exchanging with publicists and stuff. I was like, oh man, that's the book I was just going to buy, but I didn't think I could ever book that guy because he's like, you know, on the end cap display. I was going for like the lower shelf books that nobody wanted to read, thinking <laughs> the bargain table. Are you a bargain yet. table? You're not bargain table. So you you uh, you realize that you can book Scott Wynn. Like how did how does that go down? Where you're like, actually, I actually can get this guy. When did you know? <laughs> well, I think uh, coming from radio, nothing was too much. I mean, I didn't really, you know, I have no aversion talking to publicists or Hollywood agents or whoever, um, but I didn't think they buy in because we were such a small entity. We had zero reputation. We weren't task and purpose. We weren't stars and stripes. We weren't military.com. Nobody knew who, who the hell we were. And when they did email us back and say, yeah, here's some available times. We'd love to have him come on and talk to you, you know, talk about the book. I remember I had him coming in one day uh, on the same day. I had Scott come in and I had the pitcher from the Washington Nationals coming in. And you know, I was revved up. I was like, man, I got two great interviews today. And I'll be honest, I had fun talking to the Washington Nationals pitcher, but I knew we were doing the right thing when I talked to Scott because our interview was like almost an hour. And it just went exactly the way I wanted it to. I'd read the book by then and the stories you told, the inspiration you get. I mean, it wasn't just bullets flying. It wasn't just war stories. It wasn't war porn. It was straight inspirational at the end of the story and the end of the hour just whizzed by and I told my editor I was like we need to do more stuff like this we need to tell more stories like this and we need to never forget that like we're supposed to make the experience of being in the military understandable to people that were never in it and yeah. that's kind of now my goal is with these podcasts is to like not just talk to my veteran community because I you know our brothers know who we are and my goal now is to talk to like everybody out there that listens to podcasts, every person that reads the New York Times, every person that listens to end freaking PR. Um, you got to take a cup of this, man. You got to get a whiff of this because the stories that we can tell as veterans who went through any kind of shit, whether it was combat or whether it was just, you know, the joy of boot camp or being stuck in the middle of, you know, Fort Nowhere, Kentucky, um, the things we've done together. Yeah, hold, hold on. So, hold on. So, Phil's recitation of the interview is laudatory at uh -huh. best, but ultimately, what he got out of the entire book and the stories and all the stuff we we're talking about, it totally devolved like every military guy into potty humor. Yes. So, he drilled out of the one story, which was about the uh, evolution of the wag bag where guys right. take a shit in combat. And he was fascinated by that because, you know, in the Navy, They've got polished, you know, toilets on the ships and, yeah. and catered food service when they go out off off the ship, and you know they leave a very cushy lifestyle. Especially a guy that is a photojournalist for the Navy. Right, he's on the inner circle. He's doing these things. So yeah, that's what it ultimately devolved down to. But it was hilarious. And, and I want to say fun. this too for the listeners: so they understand exactly what combat camera is. That sounds badass, but let's be honest of <laughs> what combat camera is. Combat camera guys are guys that when they go to the chow hall. The lettuce is green, and they have a fork. Like when Scott and I go to the chow hall, like to, to the chow hall where Phil's going to eat, we're like, "Holy shit, a metal fork!" <laughs> we're just like amazed by that. And then the combat part of combat camera is that they definitely go out on a patrol, but then they get the fuck out of town as fast as they can on the next thing they can get it back to the safety and the uh, the comfort of uh, of sh hot showers and everything else. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, and hey, Phil, I had a guy. I love my com cam dudes, and they're now for the Marine Corps calls them strategic communications. They've elevated, oh. and our guys. I always loved including them on patrols if they had a rifle and a camera, they could come. And I had this one guy. He said, "Yeah, hey, sir, let me know if you need me to send any of my shooters out to get pictures for you." I'm like, "You mean snappers? Yeah, you guys are snappers, right? You snap photos. Oh, we shoot photos. I go, nah, we shoot guns. Yeah, you snap photos." And he thought he used that on me. Hundreds of times, never let me live it down, just because I was busting his balls about it. But <laughs> love Comcam. Well, first of all, to your point, um, one the really good food and the metal forks are the air forks. That's true. Okay, that's so true. I had crappy food and a metal fork, okay. so I was navy. <laughs> so I, I did some sacrificing. And right. to your other point, Comcam guys, the Native Americans believe that when you take a photograph of an individual, you take their soul. Yes. So I'd like to think. That my count, my body count is extremely high. I must have taken thousands of souls. There were moments when I would (laughs) stare down the jackal. I got 10 pictures of him. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, That's funny, funny. All right. So you guys are telling stories. Scott comes on. He blows your mind with stories about crapping and having to wear body armor and stuff. And you're right. These are stories. This is one of the reasons why I do my podcast is to illustrate that, one, yes, there's hard days and, and Scott's calling for rockets to be sent into buildings and people are getting, you know, the enemy's getting destroyed. But it's the humanity in between those moments, you know, when you're laughing your ass off having absolutely, even for a podcast, inappropriate conversations, you know, on a patrol, you know, trying to discuss like where the line is between being, you know, this or that, all that stuff happens. And that's really, I I think, where the interesting things are, because yeah, there's moments where life is crazy and there's shooting and there's bombs, but it's all of the other stuff where you're a human around that inhumanity, don't you think? Yeah, and it's like, it was cool for me to get a glimpse of it first through Scott, but then to realize that, like, okay, I'm a pansy that's been on a carrier for my entire tour and did a med cruise, and that was about it, and and, and got as close to war as an F-14 on a flight deck. But the guys that actually were in it are very cool because if you meet, you know, at the AMVETS post or at a concert or something, and two people discover that they both served – there's not an immediate judgment like, oh, well, you were, you're uncool and I'm not going to talk to you because I did this and your service sucked because you were only in in 1997. Um, it's a club that everybody gets to belong to because we all did raise our right hand. We all would have been there for our brothers. And it's a really cool thing to be involved with and to know that there's a community out there. And what I found in reporting on it over the last year is that that sense of community is what is really important to a veteran. Because once you're done with deployment, once you're done with your time in service, once you're home and you're rocking dad life on a cul-de-sac in the suburbs, you don't have that tribe anymore. You don't have that group. And being a member of a veteran, being a member of the group, is just, you know, if you served, even if you would have been a discipline problem, like I would have been under Major Husing's leadership, I (laughs) seriously would have been a discipline problem. (laughs) But once we're done, man, and we grow a little bit older, a little bit bolder, and a little bit more grays, just being in the club makes the world a difference. And it means that when you run into somebody that's got a veteran hat on the subway train or you sit at a bar and you see a guy with his grunt-style T-shirt, you can look at that dude and know, hey, I might have a, I might have a bro there. Yeah. I want to go talk to that guy because we're kind of one and the same, even though our services might have been radically different. Yeah, and, and service is service, right? Like once you raise your hand and you volunteer to go give something to your, your nation, you know, and, and put yourself in, in whatever harm's way the commander needs, uh, you know, that's it. You're in the club. And it's, you know, sure, Scott and I have combat time and you were on a carrier, but you know, if they would have told, say, Phil, grab your shit, you're going to Conor Province and you're going to go work on a PRT and go out every day, you would have done it. You know, you you would have you would you would have absolutely done that. So it's it's not so much about like the 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 style of the service. It's just the service in general and being able to share those moments with Vietnam vets. Heck, we talked to Jack Brenner today, and you know that that guy's incredible. I'm gonna I'm gonna interview this guy coming up, Phil. He um he's an intel officer from Vietnam. We're doing a documentary on him and like his position or thing, and it's just fascinating to hear that guy talk about. They're part of the conflict. He's an intel guy, so he didn't necessarily have to go out all the time. But still, they're in right. this hard fight, 
and you can instantly identify with, at least I can't because his job is very similar to mine, but you know, I can instantly identify with what he had to go through. And really, and this is the funny thing about conflict that I've seen a lot is, is uh, how hard you have to fight the internal machine as opposed to the enemy. Like I always spent time focused on us rather than them because that's where all the work needed to be done. That's the same. There, yeah, there's no question. There's no question whatsoever in that. Pontifications by Pete. That could be like a whole new podcast for you, like esoteric ramblings yes. of Pete Turner. <laughs> let me let me let me ask you. Ask you, you know, in the veteran community, yeah. as I'm, I'm I'm distracted, uh, short attention in theater. I'm looking at some posts, and guys hate it, especially mm-hmm. old guys hate it when you wax esoteric or sensitivity uh, about your dealings in combat or share some feelings. I think it's a generational thing. I don't know. Maybe it's a individual thing. I, yeah. but, but I I think sharing that stuff is important. And the one comment, some guy was like, oh, I'd rather have a psychopath watching my back than, you know, someone who's Mr. Sensitive. I'm like, really? Like you want a psychopath on your, in your squad. Is yeah. that a guy you want to go to combat with? I don't know. But, you know, when you interview these guys, do you – I'll pitch this one over to Phil. Uh, th- do you find that you are looking to really dig deep in- into these guys you interview who served in whatever job it is in the in the military? Like, Are you looking to find that new pearl of wisdom from these guys and girls? Yeah. I mean, I guess having done it now for over a year and talked to some – pretty significant guys everybody from you know grunts on the ground that you know did uh the surge era of of iraq to all the way back to the korean war i've talked to some really great guys uh, two former pow's in korea held in captivity for two freaking years yeah I, what i found most valuable is when i really if i can do enough bio research and find out who they are so we can just have a casual conversation about like who they are as a guy, where they grew up, you know, some small talk. I find if I can just get to the point of friendship enough to say, all right, man, we're done BS in here. Tell me a story. I've rarely been disappointed when I just, once I get the trust of my interview and once I get the good, you know, vibe going, if I just say, tell me a story, I don't even have to prompt for wisdom. I don't have to prompt for leadership sound bites. Whatever story they're dying to tell comes out. And I think that, especially for our grandparents' generations, the guys that fought in, you know, before Nam and that Korean era, um, those guys are just dying to impart something to you. And they're so honored that you'll listen. Yeah. And I think when you can just roll audio on that and say, tell me a story, everybody's got one to tell. Scott's got one too many. Pete's got some ones that are probably inappropriate and we shouldn't share um, but i mean everybody's got one story they really are dying to get off their chest and i've been lucky enough to get a microphone and the keys to unlock it so this is coming know. from the guy who's creating like the sweat in beneath his bare ass uh-huh. and the seat he's sitting on i don't know is it fabric or leather that you're on doing this episode naked <laughs> naked yeah. what do you can you see through the phone? I'm freaking on a leather couch. Yeah, I just like you know, I don't really want to paint that picture for listeners of this episode, but uh, yeah, they can they can see a snapshot of Phil on social media though. So okay, like as a guy that preps for interviews, you know, I'm looking into people's background, Scott or whoever, and like, I've done enough prep that my, a lot of my prep is done before I even talk to the person because I I know what to do once I'm in front of them. But when I'm digging in, like I know you like to do, like like when you looked into the thing that I wrote about my 9/11 story, when do you know you got it? Like, what do you? I used to have to work really hard to talk out loud about what I was trying to do until I felt comfortable with my own uncertainty, and I've kind of. I've gotten past that, but there's still a time where I know, okay, I've got it. I'm no longer worried about it. And the interview, even if it doesn't go that way, I know it's going to be fine. What's your point like that? How do you know? Mm, well, I think every good reporter or every good podcaster or every good storyteller, if that's what you're trying to get into, um, you got to you got to realize that, that especially if you're interviewing somebody else and it's not like your own story that you're telling, but if you're trying to pull interviews out of somebody, you realize that there will be a couple moments of uncomfortable silence. There will be a couple moments that you just have to let happen. And usually if those – if you ask a question and you don't get the answer you're looking for, you just kind of maybe ask it a different way. 
and you let there be some silence. And then usually at some point in time with almost every interview I've ever done, there's that moment when it turned from the first time you asked the question to the second time. And as they started talking, you could just hear the sound bites happen. And I'll give you an example. I just did one with this um, former SEAL, uh, Remy Adeleke, who uh, went on to be in the movie Transformers. And he's like a underwear model. I mean, dude's too freaking handsome. And I almost don't like him because he's that good looking. <laughs> but um, <laughs> That's what I say about, about you. Yeah, I, I think I said too much about me there. Damn it. Okay. So um, uh, we were talking, and I was going through the bio interview, and it was getting really mechanical. It was like, oh, I did this. And then a director called me and was like, would you like to read for this movie? And then I got the movie, and I was like, God, this guy's life just seems to work. I mean, he went from poverty and such, but he became a special operator, and he was great at his job. Um you know, I was waiting for the real harsh part about this. Like, the, where's the drama? Where's the sound bite? Where does the story really get good? Because right now it's too predictable. And I asked him something about, like, just off the cuff. I was like, hey, man, I noticed something about faith. It seems to be kind of a big part of your life. I was like, uh, you know, did, did that help you get through some dark times when you were in this, you know, you know, when you were on the team? And he stopped, and there's this weird pause. And he's like, you know, I didn't believe in God when I was a SEAL. And I was like, what? And from there on out, it turned and it got so cool. He told me how after he got out and he was having these problems. <clears throat> and of course, we all know disproportionately the guys that see combat have, you know, some headspace stuff. I mean, you see some stuff you don't want to see. You do some shit that's tough to do and, 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 and it takes a toll. And as it took a toll on Remy, it brought him to the point that so many of our brothers get to, you know, want to take your own life. And falling on his knees, praying to God, looking to the sky, saying, please, if you are out there, help me. I will do whatever you want. Get me through this because I have children and I do not want to feel this anyway, uh, this anymore. If you are real, talk to me. And he said from there on out, like, uh, he felt it. He felt the force tell him inside, continue what you're doing, get out of the Navy and go be an inspiration to millions. And he did. And he actually, one thing after another, suddenly made sense after he told me that story. But it wasn't until the second time I asked the question that I actually started to hear the soundbite open up. And it's a beautiful thing when you can get somebody on the line and they just pour their soul into a comment and you're just like, wow, that's freaking magic. And I just captured it. When those moments happen, you know, as a collector of stories, we start to realize that when someone has that level of truth, that level of clarity, and they share it with you, you can't say, I don't believe in God. Like, you have to go, wow, this person has that much of a change in life. If they can hear that message, and I'm not talking about God specifically, whatever that thing is, I always yeah. find myself asking, one, what the heck do I even know? And two, how am I missing what they got? Like, you know, whatever that moment of clarity is, whatever that, you know, that perspective that they give to you, you're just like, that's completely reasonable or that's completely incredible. You know, you're, you're sort of, I find myself able to sit back and be a lot more reflective and consider a lot more perspectives. Like we had this stupid thing last night with the wall where President Trump is talking about the wall and people are like going crazy because he's talking about the wall. And then people are going crazy because... Uh, Senator Schumer and uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi are talking about how immoral walls are. Like, like None of that matters to me in my life right now. Like That stuff's sort of important, but there are so many more things that should be so much more important. There's so much more clarity to be gained rather than picking a side in that stupid conversation. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what our key is to do with storytelling, <clears throat> which is why I'm glad you guys kind of encouraged me to do this and why Scott you came on my show initially and I kept doing them and, and, and you've given me leads on other military guests uh, guys with great experiences I think that <clears throat> while I used to kid myself that well I'm just a storyteller I'm just Uncle Filthy I'm just telling dick jokes in the morning that's what my role in <laughs> life is um, you do I like dick jokes the, Uncle the, uh, Filthy 
I, I really do. I really do. I, mean, you know, I go straight for the gutter with jokes. But um, I think the role of storyteller is one that's pretty important. And I think that without them, nothing any of these guys have ever done gets translated. And that's why I'm glad that you guys kind of brought me into your world and told me or let me know that telling stories is good enough. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts we can give because at the end of the day, we can't be war fighters on the ground forever. Yeah. But your experiences will affect people that may never actually strap on the boots. True confession time from Pete to Phil. My default encouragement to anybody who says, I'm thinking about doing this, is to encourage them to do that thing. So you could have said, I'm thinking about going pro and pumpkin carving. And I would have said, you'd be crazy if you didn't. (laughs) (laughs) So I appreciate you uh, giving me credit. But really, I just gave you the standard. I want anyone to create whatever it is that that they think they need to do. I want them to get started on the journey because it never, you don't end up at, you know, at the Louisiana champion of, of pumpkin carving. You end up somewhere totally different. Even if you're at that same table, the journey totally changes who you are and how you see the world. So. I won't take too much credit for doing it. You actually did the hard part of actually getting up, grabbing your ruck and, and going and, and doing the work. And that, that, you know, that's, that's to your credit. You know, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I just, like I said, give you the standard advice that I give everybody, go create something. Well, you were much nicer than Scott. Scott actually told me he wasn't certain I had a future in this and I might consider maybe <laughs> something else. He, he sent me a couple job postings that. <laughs> Checker at Arby's and stuff. I send him. I constantly send him HR links on email. <laughs> like you might want to check this out. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, you might you might want to get into this line of work. No, but you know, I love that. Be, and and we've talked about this is um, being a voice for those that don't have the capacity to share their stories. And not everybody does. Not everybody has to spill their guts in a book, or write an op ed, or start a podcast. But if you can just capture one piece of their life or their service that's important to them, something that they really remember and it's emblematic, I mean, that's such a huge thing because we're always talking about this in our circles in entertainment and media is you have to be the voice for the veteran community. And if we're not going to build this coalition of veteran artists and storytellers and be the ones that are this conduit to share these stories, they're never going to get heard. And that's just truth. And if people think they're going to get heard and they wait around and they wait around, they're going to wind up exactly like other generations of war fighters like World War II, Korea, Vietnam, where they're like, man, I wish someone would have told my story. I wish we had podcasts back in Korea. Uh, they're just not being told. So you got to do it. And I, and I love Pete's message and yours when you talk to anyone transitioning. I get these emails and, and DMs. and I got one on LinkedIn from a friend of mine. And I said, hey, so what are you going to do when you retire next summer? He had no idea. Yeah. No fucking clue what he's doing. I said, so you spent your whole career leading Marines. You're a colonel, and yet you have no idea what you're going to do when you get out. And I said, look, what did you want to do when you were a kid besides being a Marine or a soldier or a sailor or whatever? And he's joking around, and he says, oh, I was thinking about being an underwear model for Calvin Klein. I said, great, do it. Do it. I totally know a guy who got his leg blown off, <laughs> and he's an underwear model. For jockey underwear. His right. name is Chris Van Etten. He's now an actor in uh, Hollywood. He lives across the street from me. Uh, but he's doing it because he said, yep, that's what I want to do. Or he jumped on the opportunity. So nothing is out of reach. If you want to be a pumpkin carver, yeah, you're right. Start carving, bitch. Get to carving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true though, right, Phil? I mean, look at the journey you've been on. What have you picked up along the way? I mean, I, I know you and I talked about podcasting and I gave you the standard thing I tell people, but what what did you pick up along the way that you're like, holy shit, look at this thing that I have now, this this enrichment. What what was that? Well, before I talk about what I picked up along the way, I just want you to <laughs> know, hold on a second. I'm, I'm putting my shirt back on. There is no way I can be an underwear model, guys. I was just giving it the good look, and I, I, I got to lose a couple pounds. And by a couple, I think I need to lose like 25 pounds. <laughs> Yeah, is there an um, Elaine, is there a Lane Bryant for men? Right, yeah, we're the plus got, size men model. Come yeah. on, there's a future for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> the big and tall. I'm what you call a husky model. Yeah, big and tall. Let's underline the big three times, and Phil and Peter are going to do a uh, pictorial. <laughs> like, this is how you make the top of your underwear roll over. You have this kind of body. It's so hot. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> and Husing has left the studio. Uh, husky. <laughs> 
Yeah, that was my teen size growing up. Now, um, <clears throat> what did I pick up along the way? I, I guess really that, that, that if I were to, I, I would have never give anybody advice, but I mean. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now I guess really that, that that if I were to, I, I would have never give anybody advice. But I mean, I think deep down inside, like Scott said, there's something that everybody kind of always wanted to do and you should do it. You should find a way to get that done. You should, you should draw upon that. And even if it's not for professional gain or for money, sometimes just doing stuff is fun. Like I'm never going to, who's the guy, Josh Collins, the paddle boarded from yep. like Texas to Al- England, no, he did the Alaska, Alaska race. Too. Alaska, yeah, he's and yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Did you interview him? Former Green Beret, anyway. <clears throat> Dude's a warfighter. Dude's a, just just phenomenal American and totally inspiring with his paddling. <clears throat> how paddleboarding actually helped him recover from his TBI because after so many blast injuries from warfighting and security contracting, uh, mm. you know, his head was spun and 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 he ended up becoming this epic paddleboarder where they made a movie about. Uh, I look at that and I say, I live near this lake, right? <clears throat> and I, I own a couple paddle boards. And I'm on that thing. And my fat ass is trying to like keep it straight. And, you know, yeah. I feel pretty impressive if I can go 25 yards and not fall. But when I'm on that thing, it just feels good. Yeah. And I think we are so stuck in this world right now where like social media makes you feel bad and arguing makes you feel bad and politics makes you feel bad. Um, what I've learned from all the warfighters and the, enrichment I've gotten from all these guys and doing all these interviews is that there is something that makes you feel good. And when you do that, whether it's being a dad, whether it's being a paddle boarder, whether it's being a one legged underwear model, I mean, whatever the hell you want to do, man, it's in there. And as soon as you engage with that and you do it, you actually feel better in life. And I think that's really what we're all looking for is like a way to feel kind of better. And sometimes it's within us and we don't act on it. And you know, that's probably what we should all be concentrating on doing. Go be the dad you want to be. Make an extra hour to go paint something if you want, you know? Yeah. Just take the time because life is short, brother. And you don't always get, you know, all the minutes you want. Yeah, I would say you don't ever get the minutes. Well, like, even if you live a long time, at some point, what you could do and what you will do are no longer in balance, right? Like you only have so many things you're going to be able to accomplish. So you're right. Get out and go do whatever it is. And if it's not that, then find the next it and do it and repeat until you figure it out. What advice should I have given you prior to you launching your podcast? What did I miss out on? <laughs> what advice should you? Well, you should have told me that, like, one, uh, there is absolutely no way to get this right. Uh, you are never gonna. <laughs> you're never gonna get it right. I, I, I keep thinking one of these episodes is gonna be right. I'm like, God, was the Echo and Ramadi episode good? I mean, Scott found it kind of good, but it was probably too freaking long, and he talked too much. Right. Um, <laughs> this ep- this episode yeah, I, is absolutely an example of what not to do. <laughs> but <it's> free, <laughs> that's for another episode. Free for <laughs> <laughs> more HR websites are coming your way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you, man. I, I, the cafeteria link you sent me the other day, they're not hiring, and I'm overqualified to serve frickin' cafeteria food, by the way. Um, yeah, the uh, I, just, just that, it's, I, that it's virtually impossible to get right. Like, you'll, you know, I, I have a podcast project that I can't talk about yet, but it's coming up later in 2019. Um, and it's going to be a documentary, and it's done with one of the larger podcast publishers in the country, actually. You may hear one of our friends here on this call on the show as well, Mr. Scott Husing. But before I even got the up to talk to this major publisher, there was no right way to reach them. I tried it all, Pete. I was like, yeah. oh, I emailed, I made bios, I sent little demos. I was like, what do you think of this shiny thing? Do you know how I got it? I crashed a freaking cocktail party in Philadelphia. Huh. I literally went to a party I was not invited to. <laughs> there was a Q&A with a, spe- with a, with a speaker. And I grabbed the microphone from one of the employees, and I was like, "I have a question." <laughs> the yeah, question th- was: This all transpired like 
Phil is walking me through this whole episode. And yeah. the whole time he's telling me this story is I'm thinking risk. You know, he's yeah. he's assuming risk, and, but he's willing to do it instead of thinking about it and saying, oh, I wish I did this. I should have. Like, no, nah, you got to yeah. have that capacity as well to take some risks. And I mean, look how it paid off. If you just didn't think outside the box a little bit, we use that colloquialism a lot in the military. Think outside the box, like whatever, smash the fuck out of the right. box. I don't care. Yeah. I think it's for entrepreneurs, for guys that are running their own business, for guys that are artists, or whatever it is you're doing. I mean, the latest one, someone hit me up to create your own success and said, hey, how'd you wind up getting in Soldier of Fortune magazine? And for me, that's like being, that's better than being in the New York Times. Like, yeah. Soldier, everyone, every one of us grew up reading Soldier of Fortune magazine with Rambo on it. I'm like, to yes. get, you know, in that, people, and so the guy says, well, how'd you do that? I think it may have been my, my publisher. I don't know. But I said, I emailed them. Like, I, I was sitting around thinking, hey, how do I, this is a free tip for any writers or anyone yeah. for this matter. It's, this is how it's done. Like Phil, crashing a party, grabbing the mic and going gonzo. I just Googled military magazines. 20 of them pop up. I emailed 10 of them. Three of them emailed me back. We'd love to run it. So yeah. I sent them the stuff. Like, yeah. it's not rocket science, man, but you got to put the work in. And you got to be willing to risk a little embarrassment. In front of a strange crowd, or you know, getting a rejection letter via email. Which what does that what does that cost you? You don't even know the person sending it. So yeah. just hit the hit the garbage can button and move on. Yeah. But do I mean that's a great example. And this next project you got going on is not only going to be instrumental in helping share more great stories, but it takes you to another level. So I think it's really shit hot. Super cool, man. I'll uh, remember all you guys when I'm big and in uh, Hollywood and, uh, you know, sitting on my leather couch and nothing but my ascot and uh, Asian supermodel next to me. Yes, of course. Good Who good plays look. Phil Briggs in any feature film? Oh, nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> what about, uh, what's the, goo- who plays Stu in The Hangover? That guy right there. Bradley okay. Cooper. No, not Bradley Cooper. The <laughs> dentist guy. I mean, yes. Yeah, sorry, he Phil. He plays Bill. Yeah. Bill. Um, whatever that guy's name is. What's his name? Who plays the dentist in, in the uh, the Hangover? Come on, Phil. Who is it? I know exactly who you're talking about. And uh, Ed Helmsley? Ed, Ed Helms, Helms? Yeah. Ed? Ed Helms. Yeah. Ed Helms. Okay. There you go. Yeah. That's good. He can pull it off. Handsome guy. You know, willing to go to the extra yard and have his tooth yanked out of his head for the part. I like it. <laughs> Stu. Right on, guys. Well, I appreciate you both, man. I actually got to bounce because I, I, I think my... Yeah, that's step. Hold on. Oh yeah, that's definitely a diaper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my kid just literally had a blowout. I mean, this is toxic. You talk about the wag bag of life, Scott. Let me tell you, dude. I don't know if your wag bags were this nasty. This thing is full. <laughs> okay. See how it devolves. Yeah. Right back every, every, every episode. episode. Yeah. 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 Well, listen. Right. Thanks for coming on. Let's do some more, and uh, you know, just appreciate what you're doing that you're out there telling these stories and having success having folks say give us more of this stuff man that's the that's so fantastic to see that kind of that kind of uh, uh success really well we're looking to get it done in 2019 i got two of them running now called bet story you can look at that that's in every place podcasts are and then a new one called the cv report for connecting bets and you can find them all at connectingvets.com so quick shout out and i appreciate you guys letting me plug it and i'll be talking to both you guys really soon all right, brother. Semper Fi. Take care, man. Right on, man. Keep up the good work, guys. Right. See you soon.